For rendering text onto the canvas, we have the fill text and stroke text methods and the associated properties font, text align, and text baseline. The difference between fill text and stroke text is that fill text will draw text as you generally expect with solid character glyphs, whereas stroke text will just stroke along the contours of the characters. Using either fill text or stroke text is very simple. You just pass in a string as the first argument of what text you want to render. Um, you specify the starting coordinate, and optionally you can specify a max width. And the idea of max width is that your font size will automatically be scaled down uh, until the rendered text fits within the bounds of the max width. And understand that these methods have no concept of line wrapping, so the max width doesn't uh, cause your text to wrap down to the next line. There's, there's no such thing with these methods. It's always just drawing a single line of text. If you want to have wrapped text on your canvas, that's something you're going to have to manage yourself. You're going to have to figure out what the dimensions of your lines of text need to be, and then draw them one by one if you want to have multi-line text. Now, the font property is quite straightforward. You specify the font family style and size, uh, as a string, just like you would in CSS. So, for example, something like Verdana space italic space 12 point, as in a 12 point sized font. And of course, you're limited to fonts which the user's browser supports, just like with any other text in the browser. If there's anything tricky about drawing text, it's in understanding the relationship between the text line property and the x coordinate, and the text baseline property and the y coordinate. The text align property has three possible values specified as strings, left, center, or right. And the default is left, meaning that the x coordinate you specify in fill text or stroke text is specifying the leftmost coordinate of the text. If instead text align were set to center, then any text you draw will be centered around the x coordinate. For text baseline, we have six possible values alphabetic, top, middle, bottom, hanging, and ideographic, and alphabetic is the default. Here's a diagram of how these baselines relate to the text, and as you can see, the alphabetic baseline sits pretty much on the bottom of characters. So by default, when you draw your text, you're specifying the y-coordinate, which is the line on top of which the text is being drawn. If instead text baseline were set to, say, middle, then the text would be vertically centered on the y-coordinate. And if instead text baseline were set to top, then the letters would be written below that line. In this diagram, top corresponds to top of the so-called m-square, uh, not the top of the bounded box, and bottom corresponds to the bottom of the m-square, not the bottom of the bounded box. The term m, e-m, in typography has something to do with the height of a lowercase m, I believe. That's where it comes from. I'm not entirely clear on its significance, though. Anyway, here's a simple example of drawing text. Again, we have our canvas, which is 500 by 500, and we set our font to 40 point and Arial. Note that it doesn't matter in which order you specify the font family, the font style, and the font size. It'll figure it out, whatever order you use. Uh, and then we set the text baseline to top, and text align to right, and we invoke fill text with a string reading hello comma world with a coordinate of 500 comma zero. So our x and y are in the very top right of our canvas, and because text baseline is set to top, the text is rendered below the y coordinate of zero, and because text align is set to right, our x coordinate specifies the position of the right side of our text. And notice that our text isn't really flush up against the top right corner. Um, there's a little bit of space on the right and a little bit of space on the top between the text and our specified coordinate. Well, that's simply because uh, the top baseline actually isn't at the very top of the letters, it's a little bit above them. And whether you specify text align right or text align left, there's always just a little bit of space between your specified coordinate and the first character. So the gaps you see there are intentional, that's, that's how it's supposed to work. To render an image file onto the canvas, we have the draw image method. The first argument to draw image is always the source, that is an object representing the image to render. The remaining arguments are all numbers, which specify coordinates and dimensions. But there are three different ways of calling draw image, either with just two numbers, four numbers, or eight numbers. In the simplest case, with just two numbers, dx refers to the destination x-coordinate, and dy refers to the destination y-coordinate. Destination here meaning the canvas onto which we are drawing. So again, source is the object from which the image data is coming, and destination is the canvas onto which we are drawing. So in the simple case, you just specify this is the image I want to draw, and here's where I want to draw it. And so it is drawn positioned with its top left corner at the x and y coordinates specified. And whatever the dimensions of that source image, that's how large it is rendered on the canvas, such that 
uh, one pixel in the source image corresponds to uh, one coordinate unit in the destination. So if our source image is 300 pixels wide, it will render as 300 coordinate units wide, which, remember, doesn't necessarily correspond to 300 pixels on the canvas. When you provide four number arguments to draw image, the third and fourth number arguments are the destination width and the destination height. So we're saying draw this source image at this x and y coordinate and draw it to be this wide and this tall. And of course the width and height are specified in coordinate units, not pixels. So if dw is 500, then however large the source image was, even if it's just 200 pixels wide or 1000 pixels wide, it will be resized to fill 500 units in the destination canvas. Lastly, if you invoke draw image with eight number arguments, we again have a destination x and y coordinate and a destination width and height, but before those numbers we specify a source x and y coordinate and a source width and height. So rather than rendering the source image in full, we are taking a selected rectangular area from that source image and rendering it to the destination canvas. So here's an example of the simplest case of rendering an image to the canvas. First we need an image resource, which in the browser API is represented as an image object, capital I image. So first we create a new image object, but that image object doesn't yet represent any actual image. We give it an actual image by setting its source property, its SRC property, to a URL pointing to an image file. The trick though is that when you set image source, it does not immediately get that resource. That happens asynchronously, meaning that when we set image.source, the JavaScript code continues to execute even though the image is still being downloaded in the background. So if we were to attempt to use the image object immediately after setting its source property, it might render blank or incomplete because the browser may not have uh, finished acquiring that actual file. That's why image objects trigger an onload event when they finish loading the resource specified in their source property. To respond to the onload event when it triggers, we simply assign a function to the onload property of the image. And it's here in this function that we actually invoke draw image because now the image object is ready to be used. So, as you can see, our invocation of draw image simply passes the image object as the source, and it specifies a coordinate of 0 and 0, so the image is rendered at full size, with its top left corner at coordinate 0, 0. So, apparently this image has a height which is nearly 500 pixels tall, and which actually I believe exceeds 500 pixels wide. As what always happens with the canvas, if you do a draw operation that renders something outside of the bounds of the canvas, it simply just gets clipped off, so... It's perfectly okay to render outside the bounds of the canvas, it's just you of course won't see any of it. Now if we take the same example, but this time invoke draw image with four numbers, uh, again, the first two numbers are the x and y coordinate uh, on the destination, the, the canvas to which we're drawing, and then the last two numbers are the width and height. So we are rendering this image, however large it actually is, which again was something greater than 500 pixels wide and, and nearly 500 pixels tall, but instead we're smushing it into a box of 300 by 300. And again, be clear that that's in coordinate units, which, while in this case does correspond to the number of pixels on our canvas, that is not always the case. And now if we take the same example and uh, add in four more number arguments, the first four numbers are specifying a subsection of the source image. So here we are taking a subsection of our source image where the top left of that subsection is at position 150, 150, and which is 350 units wide and 250 units tall. And understanding our treatment of the source image here, um, the coordinate units are always one-to-one -one with the pixels. So this is a subsection which is 350 pixels wide and 250 pixels tall. And we are taking that subsection of the source image and rendering it to our canvas at coordinate 100, 100, uh, with a size of 300 by 300. And, as always, those are in coordinate units of our canvas, which do not necessarily correspond one-to-one -one with pixels. But, in this case, they do. And notice in this example how the image gets horizontally scrunched, because what was 350 by 250 is being scaled to fit an area of 300 by 300. Now, the source argument to the draw image method doesn't have to be an image object, it can actually be a canvas object. That is, we can treat a canvas and its current state, whatever is rendered on it currently, we can treat that as an image file and draw from it. And in fact, we can actually use the destination canvas, the canvas onto which we are drawing, as actually the source itself. 
So here now in this example, uh, again, we're drawing the same image as in the previous example, uh, which is the larger fox. But then we're invoking draw image again, this time with the canvas itself as the source. And we're taking the subsection onto which we rendered the fox and rendering it at position 5050 with dimensions 100, 100. So be clear, we're taking the current state of the canvas, which at the time of the second draw image call just has the one image of the fox on it. We're taking that, taking a subsection of it, and then drawing it on top of the canvas. So one technique that's common to use is to create a canvas element which is not actually rendered on the page. You just use it as a drawing area which is not immediately seen. You just use it to construct an image and then use that canvas, that off-screen canvas, as a source from which to draw onto an on-screen canvas, a canvas actually visible on the screen. Uh, as we'll discuss at the end, the use of off-screen canvases can be a useful technique to get better performance, especially when you're doing animation. The data for each pixel sent to your display device is made up of a channel for each subpixel. So there's a red channel, a green channel, and a blue channel. For most display devices these days, each channel is 8 bits in size, adding up to a total of 24-bit, or what's sometimes called true color. Earlier display devices were limited to fewer bits per pixel, such as 16 bits or 8 bits, and so they could only display a much narrower range of colors. 24 bits, however, gets us 16.7 million colors, which gives us a color range which seems to be the perception of the human eye, at least most human eyes. With 8 bits per channel, that means that we have 256 intensities of red, 256 intensities of green, and 256 intensities of blue, and all the combinations of those various intensities adds up to about 16.7 million distinct colors per pixel. Now, when it comes to image data, we may not necessarily want just an RGB channel, we also want what's called an alpha channel, which is a transparency value for the pixel. Obviously, a display device itself cannot render transparent pixels, but when it comes to bitmaps, we may wish to render them on top of a background or on top of each other, in which case an alpha channel, transparency values, will come into play. When I render one bitmap on top of the other, I may wish for some pixels to be fully transparent, some to be fully opaque, and for some to be somewhere in between. Now, the color channel values of a pixel are expressed in terms of an integer from 0 to 255, 0 signifying no intensity, and 255 signifying maximum intensity. So while a red channel value of 0 signifies no redness, a red channel value of 255 signifies maximum redness. The alpha channel, though, is usually expressed in terms of a floating point value from 0, 0.0 to 1.0, 0, 0.0 signifying fully transparent, and 1.0 signifying fully opaque. So, in fact, in all the drawing we've done so far, uh, we haven't dealt with any transparency, so with the alpha channel, for all of the pixels we've drawn, their alpha values have been 1.0, fully opaque. They're not see-through at all. To specify the alpha values of the pixels we draw, uh, we can do so when we specify the color. Here, where we're setting the fill style property, uh, we do so with a string reading RGBA and then in parentheses, uh, the values for the four channels. First the red value, the green value, the blue value, and then the alpha value. So we're drawing two squares here, both of which have their alpha channel value set to 1. So it's fully opaque, there's no transparency. And as you can see, the values 255, 175, and 0 uh, gets you a shade of orange, and 255, 50, and 100 uh, gets you sort of a magenta color. And notice, of course, that the magenta square is being drawn second, so it's drawn over the existing orange square. Now, if we take this example, but specify different alpha values, uh, giving the orange square an alpha value of 0 0.8, and the magenta square an alpha value of 0 0.3, uh, this is the result. First, you'll note that the orange square appears to be a lighter shade of orange. That makes sense because it's appearing on top of a white background, and as you make something more transparent, more of the underlying background shows through, so the orange appears lighter. And we see the same effect even more pronounced with our magenta square, which now actually appears pink, because we specified an even more transparent alpha value of 0 0.3, so it's even fainter. And lastly, notice where the magenta square is drawn over the orange square, the orange is now seeping through, because our magenta square is quite transparent. Now, when a transparent pixel is rendered on top of some existing background, really what's happening is that the pixel you see has its color shifted. 
Like here, our magenta pixels aren't showing up as full magenta, they're letting the background seep through. They're, they're, the color we see is being shifted. This is what is called alpha blending. And the interesting question is, what exactly is the algorithm used for this alpha blending? We'll look at that at a moment, but first you should understand that the canvas, the blank canvas, actually is not really white. It starts out actually with all the pixel values set to black, but with an alpha value of zero. The reason I'm showing the canvas background is white is because most commonly a canvas is on a white background, because by default web pages have white backgrounds. But really, if your blank canvas appears to be all white, that's just the background of the page showing through, because, as I said, the canvas starts out fully transparent. So, as I just demonstrated, the alpha values of the pixels we draw when we draw lines, shapes, and text, uh, that can be specified when we specify the color. Otherwise, the pixels default to fully opaque, to an alpha value of 1. In the case of any source images we might draw, however, those images may include an alpha channel, so the pixels from a source image aren't necessarily all being drawn at full opaqueness. And this applies when we use a canvas as a source image. For example, here we have two invocations of draw image, the first using the image object as its source, producing the large image of the fox you see, and this JPEG file for the image we're using I don't know if it has an alpha channel, but if it does, it seems that all the pixels are set to full opaqueness. They have an alpha value of 1. So all the pixels where you see the large fox, uh, those all have an alpha value of 1. And again, as we just mentioned, the canvas, all the white areas, um, still have an alpha value of 0. Consequently, when we then invoke draw image using the canvas itself as the source, rendering it at coordinate 0, 0, and a size of 200 by 200, Notice that only the fox portion of the canvas is being drawn on top of the fox. All the white that we see on the canvas are actually pixels which are fully black, but fully transparent. So when they are drawn over the existing image, they don't show up. So to be more accurate, they are actually drawn. Just by virtue of being fully transparent, they don't have any effect on the resulting image. When you draw something fully transparent over an existing image, the underlying pixels stay exactly the same. So, again, the pixels that we draw, their alpha value is determined by what we specify in the color when we are drawing lines, shapes, and text, but when we are drawing from a source image, the alpha values come from the pixels of that image. However, the complication to this is that there is a global alpha property on the context object. Every pixel we draw, its alpha value is first multiplied by the global alpha value. When a canvas is created, global alpha has the value 1, but we can set it to anything between 0 and 1. Uh, we can't actually set it higher to anything greater than 1, which means effectively that global alpha can only ever increase the transparency of the pixels we draw. It can only lower the alpha values. It can't increase them. Because, of course, anytime you multiply something by 1, uh, you end up with a lesser value. So, probably the most common use for global alpha is to increase the transparency of an image we're rendering from a source image. Here in this example, we're again rendering a subportion of the fox image uh, into the middle of our canvas. That's the larger fox you see. And then we're rendering from our canvas the portion containing the, the large fox, but re-rendering it as a smaller image located at position 5050. Uh, this time, however, we're first setting global alpha to the value of 0 0.4 before we draw the second image. And as you can see, the small fox image appears transparent. In the result, we get the pixels of the large fox image have the alpha value 1, and the pixels of the small fox image have the alpha value 0 0.4. The question that remains, though, is what are the alpha values of the pixels which overlap? Are they fully opaque with a value of 1, or are they transparent with a value of 0 0.4, or are they something in between? First, though, consider what happens when we modify our example slightly, and we first set the global alpha to 0 0.7 before drawing the first fox, and then set the global alpha to 0 0.5 before drawing the second. Well, the pixels of the large fox obviously have a alpha value of 0 0.7, because, again, the pixels of the source image all had alpha values of 1, so we multiply 0 0.7 times 1, and we get 0 0.7. For the small fox, however, now, um, we are drawing from the canvas, and the pixels on the canvas of the large fox have alpha values of 0 0.7. So, again, we multiply our source pixel alpha values by the global alpha property, which at this time is now 0 0.5. So 0 0.7 times 0 0.5 gets us 0 0.35. So the pixels being drawn in the second call to draw image are being drawn with an alpha value of 0 0.35. So the pixels of the small fox have the value 0 0.35. But again, what about the overlapping area? 
Do those have the alpha value of 0 0.35 or 0 0.7 or what? Well, it turns out that the pixels of that overlapping area now actually have an alpha value that is greater than either of the two images that overlap each other. They have the alpha value of 0 0.805. And if you first want to consider it from just an intuitive standpoint, if you put one transparency up against another, like say two uh, slides of film, uh, the result is less transparent than either. It becomes a more opaque surface with less light shining through. As for the precise formula, it's fairly simple. In this formula here, comp alpha refers to the composite alpha, the resulting alpha value of 0 0.805, and source alpha refers to the alpha value of the pixel we are drawing, and dest alpha, destination alpha, refers to the pixel on top of which we are drawing. The formula is simply to take 1 minus destination alpha, effectively to get the inverse of whatever the destination alpha value is, and then we multiply it by the source alpha and add the destination alpha. So again, intuitively, if we're drawing on top of a pixel, the result is going to be at least as opaque as the pixel on top of which we're drawing, and the question is, how much more opaque is it going to be? And the answer is, well, how much opaqueness is there left? In this case, there's 0 0.3 opaqueness left, because 1 minus 0 0.7 is 0 0.3, but it's not the fullness of that remaining opaqueness, it's the proportion of opaqueness of the thing we're lying on top. Again, think of two slide transparencies. If they both have a transparency of 0 0.5, meaning they each independently let through half of the light that shines through them, well, if we put one of those transparencies over the other, then first we're cutting out half the light, and then we're cutting out half the light again, and we end up with 0 0.75, which you'll note is precisely the result we get from this formula. In this example, the pixels we're drawing on top of are letting through 70% of the light, um, but the pixel we're drawing on top that we're overlaying itself lets through only 35% of the light, so we take 35% of the remaining 30% and add that to the 70%, and that's how much light is being let through, 80.5%, which as an alpha value we express as 0 0.805. Before moving on, do note a few interesting things about this formula, and that is that if the destination alpha is 0, then whatever we're drawing on top of it, that alpha value is going to be the same as the resulting alpha, the composite alpha, and that's just intuitively what you would expect. You have one transparency that's entirely transparent and another that's partially transparent. Well, the amount of light that's being filtered out is the same as that one that actually does some amount of filtering that isn't totally transparent. Also note that if either the destination alpha or the source alpha are one, if they're fully opaque, then the composite alpha is going to be one as well, which is precisely what we should expect. You have something which isn't see-through at all, so adding anything on top of it, which is partially transparent or not, shouldn't change that the composite is always going to be fully opaque. Lastly, for the sake of this formula, the source and the destination pixels can actually be treated interchangeably. It doesn't matter which we treat as the source alpha and which we treat as the destination alpha because it's actually a commutative formula. Just like it doesn't matter if you add A to B or B to A, you get the same result. Well, same thing here. However, this is not the case when it comes time to compute the color values of two alpha blended pixels. That is not a commutative formula, and it matters that we get straight which pixel is being drawn on top of the other. So, what is this formula for blending the color channels? First we multiply the source color value by the source alpha value, and then we add that to the product of the destination color, the destination alpha, and 1 minus the source alpha. Finally then, we divide everything by the composite alpha value. And be clear that this is done for each independent color channel, for the red channel, the green channel, and the blue channel. So say the composite red value is determined by taking the source red value multiplying it times the source alpha, adding that to the destination red value times the destination alpha times 1 minus the source alpha, all divided by the comp alpha value. We do that for all three color channels independently. Now, understanding the derivation for this formula intuitively is quite a bit harder to do. Uh, what you should note, though, is that when the source alpha value is 1, the, the alpha value of the pixel we are drawing on top of the other, when that is 1, then the resulting color we get is precisely the same as the source color. And that makes sense, because if you're, drawing, if you're drawing a fully opaque pixel on top of another, then the color's not going to change. It's going to be the same as that source color. Conversely, when the source alpha value is zero, then the resulting color value is going to be exactly the same as the destination color, because if you draw an invisible pixel on top of another, well, then the color doesn't change. It's the same as the underlying pixel. Lastly, just be clear that unlike the composite alpha formula, uh, the composite color formula is not commutative. It matters which is the source and which is the destination. It matters which pixel is being drawn on top of the other. 
If you switch them, you get a different result. To see this in action, consider again our example where we draw a magenta square partially overlapping an orange square. If the orange square is drawn with an alpha of 0 0.8 and the magenta square with an alpha of 0 0.3, then the overlapping section, those pixels, will have a composite alpha value of 0 0.86. But what color precisely are these overlapping pixels? Let's look just at the green channel. The destination green value is 175 and the source green value is 50. We plug those into our formula and we get a composite green value that rounds to 131. To find the full color, we do the same computation for the red and blue channels. Whatever values those turn out to be though, the green channel value turns out to be 131. So we just went over the alpha blending process that describes exactly what happens when you draw one pixel on top of another. However, the canvas actually has different so-called compositing modes, and what we described is the default compositing mode known as source over. If we wanted to draw with one of these alternate compositing behaviors, uh, we would set the context object's global composite operation property. For example, we could set the compositing mode to destination atop by assigning a string reading destination hyphen atop to the global composite operation property. Now, we won't go over these different compositing modes, but to give you an example, the destination over mode won't draw over any non-transparent pixels. So whatever we draw, it will only draw on those parts of the canvas that are currently transparent. Now, while in the case of destination over, I can see why it might be useful. To be honest, in some of the other cases, I'm not really sure in what scenarios, if any, you would want to use these other compositing modes. It also seems as if the browser implementations of these various modes are kind of sketchy. And also, looking at the HTML specification for the canvas element, um, it doesn't really precisely detail what exactly happens when you're dealing with pixels which are not fully transparent and fully opaque. Um, it it's not really clear what should happen when you're uh, compositing partially transparent pixels in some of these compositing modes other than the default source over. In many of my experiments with these modes, first off, I noticed that there's divergent behavior with the browsers, and in many cases, I just couldn't figure out why these compositing operations produced the pixels that they did. In some cases, they seem to use an alpha blending algorithm that differs from the one we described. In some cases, this may just be a lack of my understanding of these alternate compositing modes, um, though my suspicion is it's really just a matter of the browsers just really haven't sorted out yet exactly how these compositing modes are supposed to work. In any case, the vast majority of the time, you're going to be using the default source over compositing.